Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 27th of November, and this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 30th of November. Um, before we get started, a um, couple of risk warnings for compliance purposes as I take you through the events of this week and look ahead to what is likely to be another fairly um, decent week on the macro level, though a little bit light, shall we say, in terms of earnings announcements. And I think what we're seeing and what we have seen over the past week or so is some increasing evidence that um, an awful lot of people are winding down as we head into December and towards towards the Christmas break. And I, And I think it's not really surprising given the fact that November looks as if it's going to be a very, very decent month for equity markets in general. Over the past week or so, the outlook for stocks, as well as the global economy, has brightened considerably as the prospect of a number of vaccine candidates, along with what looks like it's going to be a relatively seamless transition of power in the US, has prompted a bout of optimism, an increased bout of optimism, I might add, that a pathway to recovery is opening up. You can really see that, I think, borne out in the early part of this week, when on the Monday and the Tuesday, we saw decent gains in the S&P 500. Um, an awful lot of those gains were predicated on the fact that while President Trump isn't going to go quietly, he is, he is basically setting in train the events for a, a fairly seamless transition of power to a new Biden administration. However, obviously, that still presupposes that um, the new US administration will be able to roll out some form of fiscal stimulus in the new year. Now, despite this brighter outlook in terms of geopol geopolitical events, um, the path to recovery continues to look fairly long and arduous. Um, and why do I say that? Well, despite the fact that France, Germany and the United Kingdom are coming out of or are supposed to be coming out of their month long lockdowns, um, that really doesn't appear to be the case when you actually look at some of the new restrictions that are being rolled out in the lead up to Christmas. Uh, you know, if we take if we take France as an example, French President Emmanuel Macron has announced a modest relaxation to France's lockdown. However, there's huge disappointment at bars and restaurants who were told they would have to remain closed until the 20th of January. Um, so that's a huge blow to France's services sector. Um, so I think while I think there is some justification here in the United Kingdom that um, services, um, bars and restaurants have been put into tier two and tier three restrictions from the 2nd of December, things could also be an awful lot worse given the fact that um, France's bars and restaurants aren't even allowed to reopen. Um, so um, I suppose it really depends on whether or not the glass is half full or half empty. Um, we've, had a, we've had a new budget from Chancellor of the, the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. Um, precious little in the way of new measures to help businesses, um, particularly hospitality businesses, get through to um, March and the potential for a rollout of a vaccine candidate. Certainly we've seen an awful lot of what I would call um, tweaks and changes, promises and what have you, with respect to infrastructure, to um, build new roads, new cycle lanes, invest in 5G, invest in broadband. Um, you know, it's all it's all it's all sort of um, looking in the right direction, and certainly I think the fact that the UK is set to borrow 394 billion pounds this year has has raised a few eyebrows, um, and I think prompted some nervousness about the fact that the Chancellor didn't outline any measures to try and recoup some of that money back. But ultimately, there really isn't any rush to do that. 30-year um, gilt yields are around about 0.85, 0.86%. 10-year gilt yields are 0.3%. I think while we're still in the middle of the emergency talking about um, raising taxes and cutting spending, 
is is a little bit premature when we haven't even hit a recovery stride yet. The time to talk about recouping some of that will be, I think, a year from now, assuming that we get a seamless path to recovery. Um, so what does that mean for stock markets and um, asset prices in general? Well, we, we're on course for a fairly quiet end of the week. Volatility has subsided quite substantially in the past three days. We can see that in the form of the S&P here today, um, given the fact that um, the US um, is off on its on a Thanksgiving break and US trading for Friday is only like is only a half day anyway. So we can expect volumes to decline quite substantially as we run into close of play um, today. Um, Asia markets have been much more positive. The Nikkei 225 has continued to make new fresh 29 year highs. And certainly I think the momentum on the Nikkei is certainly an awful lot more positive than it is for other markets more broadly. If we look at the Nikkei 225, we can still see that since we broke out above this 24,300 level, it's been pretty much one way apart from a little bit of a pullback there. And we look as if we're probably going to end the year up in up above 27,000 on the basis of current momentum, despite the fact that the oscillator continues to remain very overbought. You know, we have to go back to 1991 um, to find out when the Nikkei was last at these sorts of levels. And let's not forget the all time highs in the Nikkei are at 40,000. So we still remain some way short of those 1989 um, peaks. So certainly an awful lot potential for an awful lot more upside in the Nikkei 225. The S&P 500 has thus far managed to hold above 3,600. That for me, I think is likely to be a fairly key support level on any pullback. If we drill down into that, we can probably see that uh, much clearer on the basis of this particular four hour chart here. If we go all the way back to the middle of November, we could see that 3,600 was a decent pivot on this candle here and here to a lesser extent in and around these sorts of levels here. But certainly in terms of a round number, I think while we're above 3,600, the line of least resistance for US markets remains towards the upside on any dips lower. The DAX is proving to be slightly more problematic. It is very much underperforming, though not to the same extent as the FTSE 100, but nonetheless, it continues to remain stuck very much below these previous peaks of 13,460. And if we select year to date, um, there's a nice little year to date button that I've selected up there. Um, that is a very easy thing to do. You can basically just select the month or the indicator column and then select the star option there. You select it and then it drops into your upper menu here. So you then, whenever you need it, just select it and it will calculate the year to date move for you. And as you can see from the year to date on the DAX, we pretty much pulled back all the year to date losses on the German market so far this year. We also had news out earlier this week that the Germany 30 in September 2021 will become the Germany 40, um, though the criteria for entering it are likely to be toughened up quite considerably in the wake of the Wirecard scandal. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how many of the DAX's current, current 30 incumbents actually make it into the DAX 40 in September 2021. Nonetheless, at the moment, we're currently holding above 13,200. And I think as long as we stay above that level, we might have another crack at those previous peaks that we saw all the way back in September. FTSE 100, it's underperforming this week. It's starting to roll over a little bit after the really decent gains that we've seen so far this week. The big level on the FTSE 100 for me remains this 6,500 level here. That is significant in the context of this line here, if I just extend it to the left, like so, we can see that it acted as a little bit of a support level all the way back in January 2019. So anywhere near six and a half thousand, six thousand six hundred is going to be a tough nut to crack. But certainly we're in an awful lot much better shape than we were um, 
a month ago. When we look at the beginning of November, we were down around 5,500 and now we're around 6,300. So we put on 800 points in the space of a month. So I don't think we can be too unhappy, even though we are still significantly lower from where we started the year. I think one of the things that is obviously affecting the FTSE more than an awful lot of the other indices is the fact that it has, uh, it's, it's very heavily weighted towards UK banks. They've, 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 they've rebounded quite strongly, but it also has an awful lot of travel and leisure stocks in it. Um, companies uh, like Whitbread, who own Premier Inn, International um, Hotels Group, which obviously owns Holiday Inn, and then you've got British Airways um, as well, um, airline stocks, EasyJet, and what have you, which are weighing on the index, and obviously retail as well in the in the in the, you know next Sainsbury's, Tesco's, and what have you. So it is very much a it's very much an index that is geared to the UK economy. And that, I think, is why it's underperforming. Obviously, this is also the fact that EU-UK trade talks are continuing um, to be frustratingly slow, though time is running out for um, a deal to, to, to take shape. Um, I, think the, I think the last date, I think, for any sort of agreement is December the 10th. And um, we're starting to brush up very, very close to that. But certainly EU-UK trade talks are continuing. And I maintain that some form of deal will take place. I think there is a risk of an accidental no deal because either side overplays their hand. Um, but I think it's, you know, it, it, it ill behoves either side to start playing Russian roulette at this late stage. The fact is that we're still going to see probably significant disruption the um, beginning of January simply because these talks have lasted so long. And any deal that they rush through is going to have to be very, very well. It's going to have to be very, very much they rush through. And certainly the performance of the pound suggests that the markets are pricing in some form of deal. And I think the confirmation of that could see a little bit of a pop in the pound. But I don't expect it to go surging massively higher. Um, the euro area has its own particular problems, with Germany also imposing further restrictions throughout December. And that is also causing tensions in Europe all by itself because Angela Merkel is calling for the closure of all alpine ski resorts in an attempt to try and bear down on the rising coronavirus cases that are actually currently um, seeing a resurgence across the euro area. So, um, you know, that's sort of a, a brief pricey um, of what we're looking at this week. Quickly go back to the FTSE 100. Um, I think if we break below 62.80, I think there is a risk that we could push to the downside. If we look at the four-hour chart here, we can see that um, there is a little bit of support in and around this 6,300 area, 6,250. I think as long as we can hold above these levels here, then there is potential for um, further gains. Otherwise, we could go for a little bit of a rollover. But overall, I'm still fairly optimistic about um, the prospects for equity markets more broadly. Um, at the moment, the trend is higher, though I am a bit concerned about the fact that we are starting to lose a little bit of momentum on the FTSE index. Looking at um, the cable more broadly, we've seen a decent move higher in the pound over the course of the past few days, and that's bringing us very, very close to a very, very key resistance level um, from the peaks all the way back in 2007. That line there is really, really important in terms of future sterling gains. And at the moment, this 134 area is currently capping cable gains. But this peak here in 2007, through the peaks in 2014, if we now zoom in, we can see that we're pushing right up against it. And it also coincides with these peaks through here. So we're at a very, very key inflection point, a decision point for the pound. If we're able to really push, push through these peaks here, then we could see a fairly decent move higher up towards the 140 level as we head into 2021. And certainly I think that is my bias over the course of the next 12 months period. I'm, you know, I'm very much of the opinion that the pound has the potential for more upside 
than downside. And how it behaves over the course of the next few weeks, days and weeks, is going to be important. Look at these series of highs all the way through here. We're at a big, big level in terms of cable on a weekly chart and how it behaves over the course of the next month or so could be very important in terms of the overall next move higher in the cable rate so if you're tiny short cable um, at these sorts of levels you need to be a little bit careful yes we could drift back down to around about 132 133 and certainly at the moment that is the safety play short cable with a stop loss above these previous highs but if we do break 135 then we could really see a significant move towards 140. That is, that is, you know, that is the danger trade at the moment. Um, what could cause that? It's hard to say, but I think it's predominantly likely to be more a case of dollar weakness than sterling strength. That being said, if we look at euro sterling and this particular chart here, those of you who are regular listeners and watchers of my videos will know that I've been bearish euro sterling for quite some time. At the moment, that 88.60 level is still a very key support level. But again, I think it's interesting to note that if we do get a break below 88.60 and we get a break above 135 in cable, then you could see an awful lot of short sterling positions starting to get scrambled upwards. So, or covered, if you like. You could see an awful lot of short sterling positions um, get covered quite sharply because there's some very key resistance levels for sterling um, coming up over the course of the next month or so and particularly in December when volatility tends to thin or liquidity tends to thin out a bit you could see some very significant moves in the pound um, over the course of the next four to five weeks so those are the key levels I'm looking for in terms of sterling 88.60 euro sterling 135 cable Okay, so let's move on to euro dollar. Euro dollar appears to be pushing higher, um, not to the same extent to the pound, but again, we are finding a little bit of traction above 118.5, 119. Um, the ECB is unhappy about the fact that um, euro dollar is trading a little bit higher. Uh, if you look at the way the euro has performed over the course of the past 12 months, um, with inflation at zero percent, the last thing the ECB wants is a strong euro. But that's precisely what they're going to get um, if they um, if if the dollar continues to weaken. And I think that is the big story at the moment. For quite some time now, I've been of the opinion that the potential for a dollar rebound is has been um, fairly, you know, it has been fairly fairly high. I'm starting to revise my view on that a little bit. I haven't completely flipped on it, but there is a school of thought and the price action is leading me gradually in that direction. But maybe the dollar has got a little bit more downside left in it. At the moment, 120, 119 and a half, 120 is still a decent barrier for euro dollar. But if the US, if a new US administration really wants to weaken the dollar, um, through benign neglect, then there's really not much else anyone can do about it. And I think that is going to be a significant factor in the direction of the dollar over the course of the next few months. More broadly, our CMC dollar index, we weren't able to sustain a move higher. This bullish reversal here didn't play out as I suspected it was going to, and we have drifted back down towards these lows here. So I'm now going to remove that didn't work, wasn't confirmed, um, not a particularly successful trade there, and we have actually made a marginal new low. So certainly in terms of the CMC dollar index, momentum is fading and downside risk is growing, even if the normal US dollar index is still showing Euro, is still showing the US dollar above its September lows. This is basically indicated by this euro dollar price up here around about 120. So um, dollar weakness does appear to be starting to become more of a thing and I think that is a concern. Um, certainly looking at it against the Chinese currency we have seen um, further gains for the renminbi. There's certainly potential for more 
dollar downside there. My target for the Remnimbi is still 6.5, and that would suggest to me that the fact that we haven't reached that yet means that we probably will, and as such, um, unless we can get back above this level here, which is 663, uh, then we could well see further dollar weakness against the Chinese currency towards 6.5 which in turn will drag the CMC dollar index down as well because it has a much higher Chinese renminbi weighting than the ordinary dollar index does, which doesn't have a China weighting at all. Um, so I've talked a little, I've talked enough, I think, about um, some of the key levels that we've seen so far this, this, this week. We've obviously seen a bit of a sell-off in gold, so I'll quickly cover that for you. 200 day moving average, ladies and gentlemen, keep an eye on that. We've seen a bit of a sell off. We've seen a break below 1835, 1840. The next key support level lies on the 200 day moving average. So if we break below 1800 and the 200 day moving average, then we could well see further losses in the gold price towards 1763, which will be a 50% retracement of this entire up move from the March lows to the highs that we saw in August. So at the moment, the direction for gold does appear to be um, down towards 1763, but we would only that would only be confirmed on a break below the 200 day moving average. So I'm keeping an eye on that for, for the moment, but certainly the lack of any bounce would appear to suggest we're probably gonna see further gold weakness uh, against the US dollar, particularly if equity markets continue to push higher. So looking ahead, um, the key, I think the key benchmark for next week, the key, the key event for next week is going to be non-farm payrolls, which is due on the 4th of December. I think one of the most encouraging things that we've seen um, with respect to um, non-farm payrolls in the US labor market has been uh, the improvement in the unemployment rate. We've come down from 14.7% in April to 6.9% in October. Now, this trend is expected to continue in the November numbers with a further decline to 6.7%. Um, now, weekly jobless claims had until two weeks ago been on a downward track. They have now started to edge back up again. Um, and that is a worry. Um, what we saw I think with respect to um, the weekly jobless claims was that we hit a low of around about 709,000, um, 711,000 two weeks ago. We've since jumped back up to 778. And I think there is a risk that with all the Thanksgiving shutdowns, the lack of fiscal stimulus, that we've probably seen the low point in jobless claims and we're probably going to start ed edging back up uh, above 800,000. Um, a week. Now, if we start to do that, then obviously the calls for Democrats and Republicans to put together a limited stimulus plan will continue to grow as we head towards Christmas. At the moment, there really isn't any um, pressure on US politicians to sort their lives out when it comes to a stimulus plan. But I think if we get a fairly weak payrolls report next week, and the estimate for next week has come down from 600,000 jobs. Um, in November to 500 from the 638 that we saw in October, if that continues to come down, then I would expect pressure to grow. Certainly the weakness of the dollar has been um, showcased quite nicely in the way dollar yen has traded. We're still in that downward channel. So I would again expect any rebounds in the dollar to find resistance up above the cloud resistance and this trend line from the highs. Um, against a backdrop of a weakening um, a weakening US labor market. Other things to keep an eye out for next week are the latest ADP payrolls report, which is due out on the Wednesday the 2nd. Um, we've also got the ISM manufacturing and non-manufacturing reports from the US economy, which, which again, keep a close eye on the employment components of those two reports, particularly the services sector. And, and it's, and it's going to be the services sector that, again, will take up most of my attention when it comes to the latest economic data that's due out next week. On the 1st of December, we've got the manufacturing PMIs, which by and large have been fairly positive. Um, I think they have been um, an oasis of hope in the um, economic 
um, activity that we've seen throughout October and November, um, certainly in France and Germany. Germany in particular remained fairly strong at 57.9, so we're going to get the final manufacturing PMIs from the likes of Germany, France, Spain and Italy, as well as China. China, again, looking fairly strong. No, you know, no evidence of a second wave of coronavirus cases in China. That the Chinese economy has continued to recover. Then on the third, we have European services PMIs, and this is where I think the weak points will continue to manifest themselves. If we look at um, Italy and Spain in particular, there's got to be significant concern about activity there, as well as France, which saw a flash PMI of 38 in its um, November numbers when it reported them last week. Well, that's likely to be confirmed at 38. The fact that bars and restaurants are likely to remain closed until January is likely to weigh on the December numbers as well, which means that the outlook, particularly in countries like Sp Spain, Italy, France, is likely to remain weak, and yet the EU is still arguing about their own fiscal stimulus plan. You really couldn't make it up. Um, it's absolutely mind-boggling how the European Union, in the middle of an economic crisis, continue to argue about the fact that um, they need to do some form of fiscal stimulus. We've also got UK services PMI, and again, that's likely to be fairly soft, though I was actually pleasantly surprised to only see a flash reading of 45.8. I was certainly expecting a weaker number than that. That could well improve modestly in December, but even so, the Tier 2 restrictions and the Tier 3 restrictions are likely to mean that any rebound is likely to be modest at best and certainly not enough to pull the December numbers back into any sort of um, expansion when we come to report the December numbers in January. We've also got a whole host of other UK data, consumer credit, mortgage approvals. Um, they've, they've bounced back quite nicely over the course of the past few months, particularly mortgage approvals, which are back at levels last seen in 2007, um, as um, home buyers take advantage of the um, stamp duty um, stamp duty changes, which are due to expire at the end of March. In terms of earnings, um, there's not really that much to talk about when it comes to UK numbers. Um, there's Go Ahead Group. They uh, they basically run the franchises for Southeastern and South and Southern and Thameslink Railway. Um, their first quarter numbers. Um, not really expecting anything particularly spectacular there. However, we do have snowflakes, um, third quarter numbers, which are due out since first numbers since their IPO. So there's an awful lot, there's not an awful lot of price action there. Um, but certainly I think um, when you look at the IPO price of $120 a share and where it is now, over $300 a share, you sort of got to ask yourself whether or not um, the, uh, there's, there's any further upside in the share price. But at the end of the day, um, what does it matter when you've got high-profile backers like Salesforce and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, who have basically invested $250 million each in the business, well, over $500 million in, in that particular business, in a business where Snowflake's nearest competitors are the likes of Amazon and um, and uh, and Google. Um, so those numbers are due on the 2nd of December. And then we've got Zoom's uh, numbers on Monday. And um, these numbers have taken, a, or their share price has taken a little bit of a dip um, over the course of the past few weeks, mostly on the back of... Um, what I would call the reopening trade. Um, so you can sort of time it from when the vaccine news started to hit the wires. And as a result, these home working stocks, these um, what I would call online um, stocks have taken a little bit of a knockback. Um, but when you consider how far the shares are up so far this year, we're always due a little bit of a pullback. Um, so their third quarter numbers are due out on the Monday. And certainly there's no doubt that Zoom has done very well. But I think in terms of its infrastructure, there are signs of growing pains. There's been a couple of outages. 
in uh, in recent weeks and months, which suggests that uh, the infrastructure is starting to creak, and that would suggest that maybe they need to do an infra lot, a lot more investment in terms of support supporting their architecture. Um, so um, I think the fact that they're also competing in the same sandbox as the likes of WebEx, LogMeIn, and Skype maybe have prompted them to up their games. But having said that, profits are still expected to come in around about 75 cents a share. However, I do question whether or not um, a company that came onto the market with a valuation of $9 billion, $9 billion is worth a market cap currently of $125 billion. But I suppose that's really another story. Anyway, so that's it. We've also got Salesforce latest numbers. They stuck in a bid for Slack Technologies last week. We could get some further news on that. But other than that, I think that's pretty much it for uh, this week, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Wish you all a pleasant weekend. And I look forward to actually seeing some of you or hearing from some of you in our non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday, the 4th of December, which starts at 1.15 p.m. So if you're interested in that, that um, then please sign up for that um, on the CMC Markets website. Um, so that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.